This monk was found alive in a meditative state inside a cave. It are they generating in Tibet? Are they generating their own energy? What is this? Can somebody tell me what this is? Hey, happy Friday. Welcome back to another creepy video. I'm Jesky Chuck, and on these creepy discoveries on TikTok, you remember to keep your head always on a straight swivel. Now let's get into these creepy videos. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, find that bell, turn notification to all so you don't miss a video or live. Let's go. Can somebody tell me what this is? Because they just found this somewhere over in uh, Tibet or something. Look how big it is. And it looked like somebody had this thing tied up and then it took the ropes off of it. And his arms are still moving like it ain't even got rigor mortis. What the f man, y'all. This is crazy. Like he said, it looks like you could barely hear him, but it looks like he said the arm is still moving. How creepy is that? The truth about giants been in our face the whole time, bro. Petrified. Like, look at that. I'm telling y'all, yo. This was a couple right before they died. They perished. Something happened, yo, that made everybody turn to stone like on some Medusa shit. I'm trying to tell y'all. Hey, look at that. Look at that mitt. Creepy. Look, if you turn the phone sideways, you could just see the face of the mountain right there. Crazy. Petrified big ass elephant. Look at that shit. Now you telling me they not telling me that's a grandpa that was sitting before you, you know what I mean? Bro, this is a female's body. Y'all see that? Look at the foot. Shit! The truth about John. Where's this one at? The waterfall with the mouth coming at? That's the one I want to see. Dang. Interesting. Have you heard of the secret Tibetan library? What they found inside will shock you. In 1901, a remarkable encounter unfolded high in the mountains of Tibet. A traveling anthropologist met a Buddhist monk who unveiled a secret, the Cave of Thousand Buddhas. Inside lay a treasure trove of manuscripts spanning cultures, including Hindu texts. But one manuscript stood out, an ancient map revealing Atlantis from the Pillars of Hercules to the Yucatan. This discovery links the ruins of Cuba to Atlantis, explaining the shared architectural wonders from Peru to Egypt. What's more, every ancient structure meticulously aligned itself to true north, signifying an obsession with cardinal points. This revelation offers a tantalizing glimpse into a lost civilization's legacy, urging us to delve deeper into the mysteries of our ancient past. Watch the full video to unlock the secrets of Atlantis and uncover the hidden connections woven through time and space. The ancient library of Tibet, hidden in the Patala Palace, contains over 84,000 manuscripts covering a wide range of subjects, including religion, philosophy, medicine, astronomy, and astrology. Only 5% of these manuscripts have been translated into other languages, leaving the majority of them shrouded in mystery. Despite its significance, few people have been able to access its contents due to the political barriers and technical challenges in translating the complex scripts and languages. However, there have been efforts to preserve and translate the manuscripts by organizations such as the Tibetan Buddhist Resource Center and the International Dunhuang Project. As the world continues to recognize the value of these texts in preserving Tibetan culture and history, there is hope that the secrets of this ancient library will be revealed to a wider audience because... The ancient library of Tibet, hidden in the Patala Palace, contains over 84,000 manuscripts. Tibetan Buddhist monks can sit for hours outside in the freezing cold snowy mountains without suffering from frostbite or hypothermia. In fact, their bodies actually get hotter. This seemingly magical ability stems from a secretive technique called Tumo. 
Tumo, which translates to inner fire, is an ancient and sacred Tibetan Buddhist practice. Tibetan monk and Tumo teacher Garshan Rinpoche says that Tumo is a teaching that is strict and not one that is freely dispensed to whoever wishes to receive it. However, Tumo is just one technique from one culture and we're sharing this story with you so you can understand the human potential. The meditation and breath work that we teach is simply practical. There's no religion tied to it. Think about it this way. Your mind is the basis of everything you experience in life. Your breath is the power source to your mind. And we take thousands of breaths every day. When do we take the time to improve the quality of these breaths? By practicing conscious breathing exercises and meditations, we improve the quality of our breath, which improves the quality of our mind, which improves our entire life experience. Tibetan Buddhist monks can sit for hours I know I've been breathing all wrong. Definitely need to breathe better. Some nights I gotta prop myself up just so I can sleep, you know? I feel like these deep breathing techniques come in handy. Are they generating in Tibet? Are they generating their own energy? What is this? Yeah, <laughs> Chamboli. <laughs> I don't know why, but you know, there's some type of peace emitting from him, his aura. I don't know why, but I have a really good feeling about him. I can't explain it. some type of glimpse and see what's going on over there. Yeah, yeah. 
I think they were asleep. Please tell me they were all asleep. I don't see nothing crazy anywhere, so they had to be asleep. I don't see nothing crazy anywhere, so they had to be asleep. We're just gonna go with they were asleep, y'all. Tibet China is low key. I've never heard of them like that. I've heard of the Tibet library while we're diving into it, but who knew that they had all this culture down there? This world is a big place, y'all. I'm starting to realize that for real. <laughs> this monk was found alive 200 years later. Last year in the Mongolian mountains, this monk was found alive in a meditative state inside a cave. It turns out he had been there for around 200 years, and apparently the Power of meditation kept him alive this whole time. The word spread out quickly around the world and people wanted to see him for themselves. But rumors say that the monk was sold on the black market for an insane price. Because people believe whoever has him in their position will become extremely lucky. This monk was found alive 200 years later. Do you think this monk who has been meditating for 200 years may still be alive? This man is a Tigala, and he is a Buddhist monk who lived in Siberia Buryat between 1852 and 1927. Before this monk died, he told his disciples that his time had come and that they should bury him in a meditation position. And he mentioned that if they opened his grave 50 years after his death, he would come back to life. His grave was opened in 2002 accompanied by cameras. What experts encountered shocked people. Itigilov's body was still soft and warm, his body was too hot for a dead person. Scientists took samples from the monk's body and examined them. And the second shock happened here. The cells were still alive, but their reactions had slowed down. Do you think 
this monk After this video went viral, many netizens speculated that the monk in question was 399 years old, attributing his longevity to an ancient ritual practiced by monks called Sokushin Butsu. This practice, which is rare among Japanese monks, involves a rigorous self-discipline regimen where individuals essentially undergo mummification while still alive. However, the truth is that the monk, named Luang Fo Yai, hails from Thailand and did not actually perform the Sokushin Butsu ritual. He was not as old as the rumors suggested. Born on August 12, 1913, Luang Po Yai was a respected Buddhist monk who dedicated 77 years of his life to his spiritual path. According to local news, he passed away in 2022 at the age of 109 after receiving medical treatment for hip pain. After this video went viral, many netizens speculated that the This is the shocking true story of the 200-year-old mummified monk who is still alive. Although the monk is mummified, reports say that he is not actually dead but in a deep, meditative state. There has been so much curiosity about him that people have been trying to smuggle and sell him on the black market. And although they're not 100% on his identity, they believe he was a teacher who told his students he was going to die and to dig him up in 30 years. This is basically what Japanese monks do where they mummify themselves while they're alive. Okay. So they'll strip themselves of like any, any fats, <clears throat> muscles, they would go to the mountains and basically stay in that state until they pass over to the next life, mm -hmm. right? Basically what Japanese monks do where they mummify themselves while- This library was not discovered until 2003. The Santa Monastery in Tibet holds 84,000 handwritten scrolls dating back 10,000 years. Hi, I'm in Tibet or Xizang. This land is full of mystery to me. In 1951, the region was peacefully liberated. Feudal serfdom was abolished and the Chinese government established a socialist system in Xizang. So what's the historical significance of the peaceful liberation of Xizang? For more than 700 years, it has been an inalienable part of China's territory. However, given its strategic location from the 7th to the 20th centuries, the Mongols, Indians, and the British all convicted Xizang in an attempt to control the region. In the face of the crisis, the newly established Chinese government decided to peacefully liberate Xizang in a year. The feudal serfdom system in old Xizang was very cruel, and there were once millions of serfs here. The feudal serfdom system not only violated basic human rights, but also hindered social development. The peaceful liberation accelerated economic and social development. More than 700 years ago, more than 90% of the people in Xizang didn't own their own houses. Today, nearly 99% of farmers and herdsmen own their own homes. And since the peaceful liberation of Xizang, freedom of religious belief has also been fully guaranteed. That's what I have observed. Hi guys, I'm in Tibet or Xizang. You know, seeing all these old world structures they have is fascinating. How they're spinning those drums? What is that? What's the significance of that? And it's so fascinating. So, people often ask me how good these lenses are. Check this out. That's pretty good. In 2003, the ancient Sakya Monastery in Tibet unveiled a hidden treasure, an extraordinary library concealed behind a wall. A staggering 84,000 manuscripts preserved for centuries were stacked in a secret chamber. Speculation arose that these documents could hold the secrets of 10,000 years of human history. However, scholars quickly debunked the notion of a decamillennial archive, citing the earliest known human writings from Mesopotamia around 5,500 years ago. Yet, the staggering number of manuscripts, verified by the Congressional Executive Commission on China, suggested a profound historical repository. Hidden within the monastery's labyrinthine racks, one exceptional book stood out, a scripture weighing an astonishing 102 pounds. The Tibetan Academy of Social Sciences meticulously indexed and digitized the collection, uncovering an array of Buddhist scriptures handwritten in Chinese, Tibetan, Mongolian, and Sanskrit. 
The library not only housed religious texts, but also delved into literature, astronomy, mathematics, art, agriculture, history, and philosophy. Historical accounts added a layer of mystique, describing books adorned with gold letters bound in iron and embellished with images of a thousand Buddhas. These extraordinary manuscripts, crafted under the decree of Emperor Kublai Khan and presented to the fifth leader of the Sakya school, Phagpa Lama, showcased the opulence and dedication of ancient scribes. The Sakya monastery itself had weathered centuries of change. Founded in 1073 CE by Kun Konchok Gyalpo, it underwent destruction during the Lhasa uprising in 1959 and the Cultural Revolution in 1966. Premier Zhou Enlai's intervention spared the Sakya Library, leading to its reconstruction in 2002. Today, as the Tibetan Academy of Social Sciences continues its meticulous cataloging, experts regard the Sakya Library as the largest surviving historical account of the Tibetan regions of China. A hidden gem, rediscovered and preserved, it holds the promise of unveiling the rich tapestry of Tibetan history and culture offering a window into the ancient world that was once obscured behind monastery walls. In 2003, a couple things stood out from to, a couple things stood out to me from that video. The thousand pound book, which has a correlation to that giant that we saw in the beginning of the video and these Buddha statues. Look at these. I believe that's what it is. I'm not too sure what these golden statues are volumes bound in iron they keep taking down any comment tagging me to fact check so here we go this is sakya monastery in tibet no these volumes these volumes bound in iron they keep taking down any comment tagging me to fact check so here we go this is sakya monastery in tibet no these volumes are not secret you can find that out from a basic google search there are not 84,000. 84,000 is a reference to the number of the buddhist teachings and if you look at the walls you can tell that it is less than that people do know what the texts are the monks specifically do they keep their libraries very well organized and the ends of the books are all labeled with the book title that's what the little flaggy tags are. They are not bound in iron. Tibetan books are not bound in iron. They are bound in wood, which you can also see in the video. But they take down any comment where I correct it. They claim scholar Sarat Chandradas, who lived 100 years ago, says they were iron bound. Do not provide any source for that, and I can't find any source either. Then send me this message, which I can't reply to because they don't follow me. Meanwhile, here are my qualifications. Hi, my name's Amali. I'm doing my PhD in Tibetan studies. This is me translating for a Tibetan mama in Mongolia because I'm fluent in Tibetan. I work alongside monasteries in Tibet to catalog their ancient and rare texts and artifacts, like the 1,000 year old Tana Monastery in Tibet. As for Saki Monastery, I worked at their official U.S. branch for several years as a translator. And here's me at a 1,200-year-old monastery petting a one-horned goat. Technically, it's a unicorn. These volumes bound in iron. Interesting. Today, I am going to a stupa consecration, and so I want to take you along. Now, you've heard me mention stupas before because I live near Boda, which is one of the largest stupas in the world. But stupas are essentially Buddhist reliquaries. They can be super tiny. Some are absolutely massive, like this one but they all must have a dome shape and a spire and contain some sort of relic inside. So we made our way outside of Kathmandu and up to the mountains. Here we are. I wonder what type of relics inside. We are in a Tamang village not far from Kathmandu and you can see the stupa, it's covered, which means the consecration isn't finished yet, but it's decorated and celebrated and when that covering is removed, then it will be officially active. Lamas and other practitioners have been invited to read texts and rituals for the consecration and this is all being held in this tent which is right next to the beautifully decorated stupa. One Rinpoche, or important Lama, is the main Lama presiding. So people are coming and offering silk scarves, which is traditional. And of course, your speech is made by sponsors. The Eglis and sponsors get a chance to walk around the stupa first, and then food offerings are shared with the entire community. The statue is being consecrated too, so after it is uncovered, people throw flowers and colored rice on both the statue and the newly uncovered stupa to celebrate its consecration. It's a beautiful day. What's it like to live around a 1500 plus year old UNESCO World Heritage Site? Hi, my name is Molly. I speak a whole bunch of languages. I'm a professional interpreter and language educator, and I live here. If you don't recognize this, this is the Boda Stupa in Kathmandu, Nepal. A stupa is a Buddhist monument reliquary, and Boda is one of the largest in the world. 
Not only that, it's also one of the holiest. The first thing you'll notice here is that it's a walking area, and everyone's walking the same direction. One form of Buddhist worship is walking clockwise around holy sites. Maintaining this as a walking area allows people to do that, and out of respect, even non-Buddhists tend to walk clockwise here. And you'll see people here from sunrise until late evening, especially elders of the community who basically make walking around here their retirement plan. A lot of the shops specialize in selling religious objects, but of course we also have snack shops and coffee shops. But if you want to get to a convenience store, you have to get out of the immediate circle. And there are temples scattered all around. Today, because of the weather, it's pretty empty. But on a Buddhist holiday, this place will be swarming which hopefully I'll be able to show you in a day or two. As Buddhist pilgrims from all over the Himalayas and all over the world will come here to worship. But the best part about living here is the community. The people who live here know and respect the integrity of this site. And even though we don't all share a common religion, we do share a common respect. And the result is a community where even though we don't know each other's name, we know each other's smiles and we take care of each other. The only train in the world where passengers willingly wipe their windows. The Z6811 train, departing from Shining and acclaimed as one of the most beautiful railways in Tibet, taking a total of 20 hours, all the way to Lhasa. Wiping the train windows, it's not a mandatory task, but it's an expression of anticipation for the breathtaking scenery that lies ahead. First, the train will cross Qinghai Lake, Tibet's largest inland saltwater lake. Next, Haozil, the habitat of the Tibetan antelope and one of Tibet's largest natural reserves. Then, the Kunlun Mountains, known as the barrier of the roof of Kunlun Mountains? Hey, we, isn't there a spine up there? That's why they wiping those windows. They trying to see that dragon spine. The world. Afterward, Tangula Mountains, wonder and grandeur of nature. Finally, Ho Na Lake, high-altitude mountain lake with crystal clear waters. This will certainly be an unforgettable train ride that will stay with you for a lifetime. Follow us as we explore the world together. This is the... Damn, would you guys do that train ride? I know I would. 20 hours? Man, I hope they got snacks. The next station is Tibet. In the Himalayas in Asia with a distinct culture and religion, and it is often referred to as the roof of the world due to its high altitude and unique geography. In 1950, the Chinese Communist Party took control of Tibet, and declared Tibet to be a part of China and began to exert its authority over the region. The Tibetan people, were subjected to a range of repressive policies, including restrictions on their religious practices, language, and freedom of movement. Despite these challenges, life in Tibet continues to be shaped by its unique geography, religion, and culture. The Tibetan people have a deep connection to their land and traditions, and they continue to maintain a strong sense of identity and pride in their heritage. Let me know your thoughts on this in the comments section, and please subscribe for more content like this and as always, Hi, I'm here to fact check real quick. Lauren Gar is not in Tibet. It's in Sichuan province. So here's Sichuan province, here's Tibet. Lauren Gar is over here, I think, in this area. This is where the Garza Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture is. At the national level, mainland China is broken down into 22 provinces, two special administrative regions, that's going to be Hong Kong and Macau, Four municipalities, that's going to be cities that essentially operate like a province. It's going to be Beijing, Chongqing, Tianjin, and Shanghai. And then five autonomous regions. That's going to be Inner Mongolia, Xinjiang, Ningxia, Guangxi, and Tibet. That's at the national level. 
But within provinces, there are more divisions as well. And one of them is the autonomous prefecture. And that's what Lauren Gar is in within Sichuan. It is the Garza Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture. An autonomous prefecture is an area within a province where the population is made up of more than 50% of an ethnic minority, or it is an area that is of historical significance to an ethnic minority in China. There are 30 autonomous prefectures within the provinces in China, and one of them is the Garza Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture within Sichuan province. This is an area where the majority of the population is made up of Tibetans. It's also of historical significance to the Tibetan people. Now, it's very possible that this person is saying that Larangar is a part of Tibet as a political statement because the Guards of Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture used to be a part of the Kham region, which was one of the three traditional regions of Tibet. So here we have two maps of China. This is a map of China as it is divided up today. This is a map of China as it was divided up during the Republic of China period from 1912 until 1949. And the highlighted area right there is what used to be the province of Shikong. The province of Shikong is what is now known as the Guards of Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture. It was given to the prominent Sichuan warlord Yu Wenhui, and the province actually existed into the People's Republic of China. Uh, the province didn't go away until 1950. In 1950, the province of Shikong was split, with part of the province going into Sichuan and the other part going into Tibet, which leads to this current rendition here. Um, slight correction to my previous statement. Uh, not all of Shikong is the guards of Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture. Part of what merged with Sichuan became that autonomous prefecture. Now, I'm all out of order. I'm so pissed off because I can't edit a video if I stitch it. So just put a pin in what you just learned. We're going to backtrack a little bit. <laughs> so how did the Republic of China end up getting control of the Kham region? Um, so this happened in 1910. So in 1910, General Zhao Arfang occupied the region, gained control, and then turned it into the Shikong province. In 1930, the Tibetan army actually came in and reconquered the region briefly. Oh, and y'all probably want to know what the heck Larangar actually is. Um, so, so it's this community that grew around a Buddhist academy. It's this massive monastery community. I believe it's the world's largest monastery community. Either it is or it used to be. I know there's been a lot of demolitions within this region since 2016. Um, so I don't know if it still holds that title, but it's really, 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 really big. Um, yeah. So the more you know. <laughs> All my effort uh, to cool down the situation failed. Uh, and soon after there was a bombardment by the Chinese. So then there's no other choice except escape. Then the question was, how do you get out of this without being noticed? That was interesting. Let me know your guys' thoughts in the comments below about ancient Tibet.
Most cultures on Earth bury their dead. Most, but not all. In Tibet, where much of the ground is too hard and rocky to make grave digging practical, and where there are almost no trees needed for a typical Buddhist cremation, the Tibetans have turned to a tradition that is as ghastly as it is beautiful. Sky burial. But this funereal practice is anything but a burial. In Buddhist belief, as with other faiths, including Christianity, once a person dies, what remains is just an empty shell. It requires no special or sacred care. Buddhism practices kindness and benevolence to all living things, not just your fellow human beings. It's considered imperative to not waste any opportunity to help another living creature. As such, a sky burial is a way to dispose of human remains in as generous a way as possible, nourishing even the animals. And you should know that some of the descriptions that follow may be a bit difficult to hear, but I won't be showing any graphic imagery. After death, the corpse's spine is broken so that it can be folded in half and carried up a mountain on the back of a rogyapa, or a body breaker. Think of a yagrapa as an equivalent to a Western funeral home employee. Once at the designated site, the rogyapa places the corpse face down, removes its hair, and hacks off all of its limbs, sometimes flaying the meat from the bones and throwing it to the gathering vultures. After the scavenging birds have feasted, the remaining bones are pounded into a pulp mixed with barley flour, tea, and yak butter and given to the crows and hawks. Nothing is wasted. Like I said, ghastly and yet undeniably beautiful. Stay curious, my friends. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. A little bit disturbing, too. The Library of Ancient Knowledge found a Tibet with 84,000 rolls and untouchable books. The path of enlightenment for the history of the Tibet Autonomous Region goes through a Buddhist temple some 4,300 meters above sea level. In 2003, a giant library was discovered nearly 60 meter long and 10 meter high wall. A huge library of as many as 84,000 scrolls was found sealed up. It is known as the Library of the Sakya Monastery. The Sakya Monastery is located in southern Tibet. It was built in 13th C. It is one of the largest collections of Tibetan and Indic manuscripts and block printed books. It's contained the history of humanity. It is thought to shed light on humanity's thousands of years of history. These books include works of literature and on history, philosophy, astronomy, mathematics, and art. These books are preserved here in many volumes written in gold letters. The pages are six feet long by 18 inches in breadth. In the margin of each page are illuminations, and the first four volumes have in them pictures of the thousand Buddhas. These books are bound in iron. They are thought to have remained untouched for hundreds of years. It was founded in 1073 by Konchok Jyalpo. Originally Konchok Jyalpo is an Ingmapa monk of the powerful noble family of the Tsang. Sakya Monastery also is known as Pal Sakya. Historians believe they were prepared under the orders of Emperor Kublai Khan. Many believe it is just like the Apostolic Library in the Vatican also with underground bunkers with plenty of art. Such an astounding archive of tomes, coupled with a colossal collection of artifacts, has earned the monastery the nickname the Second Dunyuang, in reference to the city in northwest China's Gansu province, famed for its grottoes featuring Buddhist murals and manuscripts, past the mammoth entrance of the complex, and through a tunnel lined on both sides with copper prayer wheels, is a court leading to the main prayer hall. As you cross from the shaded passage to the sunny space, a carnival of colors greets your eyes. Tibetan prayer flags with their five characteristic colors, blue, white, red, green, and yellow, are wrapped around a pole, while traditional motifs adorn the brightly painted walls. Meanwhile, your auditory senses are treated to a mishmash of sounds that blend together harmoniously chanting monks, chattering visitors, and cooing pigeons flapping their wings. Most people in this life will never get to see them or even hear about this. But time is an unforgiving force. The towering walls might have guarded the temple as one century gave in to the next, but the artifacts have not been as immune. The digital era, however, has thrown a lifeline to the invaluable articles of the Sakya Monastery, as notebooks and scanners turned obsolete. An archiving project has been underway since 2015, examining 26 types of ancient artifacts, including frescoes, porcelain items and instruments, and digitally recording their details, giving them a new lease of life in the 21st century. Where is this information at then? If they recorded it and they're starting to translate it, I feel like we need to know about that. Wonder how much knowledge will be lost if someone destroys this place. 
Similar incidents already occurred in human history in the distant past, when the invaders from Spain destroyed all the sacred books of the Aztecs, because they thought it was the devil's work. We must act quickly to save them before the commies burn them amidst the crackdown on Buddhism in China. What do you think about this? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. If you guys made it this far, be sure to drop a like and a subscribe. And I just want to thank you guys for joining me on these waters. And I'm going to catch you guys on the next one. Peace out.